Hello, everyone, and welcome to the full papers session number five on situated displays and guidance. My name is Michael Sedelmeyer from the University of Stuttgart, and I will be the session chair for that session here. We will have three fantastic talks, and we're going to start with uh, Jorgos Koenen, uh, who will be talking about the public data visualization, analyzing local running statistics on situated displays. Here we go. I'm a PhD candidate at the K. Leuve University in Belgium, and I'm presenting this work titled Public Data Visualization, Analyzing Local Running Statistics and Situated Displays, on behalf of my supervisor, Andrew van der Moede, and myself. Public displays have become a common technology that allows any person to engage opportunistically with dynamic information within public space. Often this is in the form of advertising displays or wayfinding kiosks. More than a decade of scientific studies have demonstrated how successful public displays need to be well positioned and take into account the spatial dimensions of the space and consider the appropriate comfort, social, and activation spaces. They should align their content and interaction to the sweet spot where content, people, and location are matched and evolve appropriately in a community over time. As a specific type of public displays, public data visualizations communicate data in the relevant context in a situated manner are displaced nearby or in the context of the data referred. Such public data visualizations have been demonstrated to spark debate in social contexts, for example, about household energy consumption by visualizing power usage on facades of homes, as well as wider local and neighborhood issues. We observed an opportunity in the public visualization of personal running performance data due to its social nature and intrinsic connection to a physical context, with the potential for meaningful collaborative sense-making in the place of the activity. Furthermore, this data is increasingly being collected and made available through APIs for applications such as Strava or RunKeeper. We began this research with pre-design work at running events, where feedback is typically rather minimal, such as this scrolling list of finishing times, color-coded only by gender. Yet there is an active community at these events eager to review and socialize around the performance data for which we then designed an initial public data visualization design that shows the performance of two runners side by side in various categories, similar to a sideways turned parallel coordinates plot. This prototype gathered a lot of interest at multiple running events, but proved challenging to research due to difficulties in acquiring results data in a timely fashion while on site, as well as capturing the experiences of large groups of people, plus the added logistical challenges of deploying the interface at many events. However, results from our pre-design study hinted that the final visualization, along with immediate walk-up and use usability, should offer explicit hints to make people aware of the offered interaction possibilities, both in terms of the insights that can be discovered and the data analytical operations that the interface affords. It should also offer easily accessible features that promote active hypothesis forming and more than one display to support concurrent use, as we observe groups of users to engage together, yet take turns to look up only one run at a time, essentially only using one side of the public visualization. Based on these early findings, we refined the visualization design into the final prototype. This visualization uses the now deprecated Strava API endpoint for segment leaderboards, which are essentially competitive rankings of user-defined tracks, or what on Strava are called segments. This design retains the top to bottom listing of categories from the pre-design, but each category was now presented on the same, not normalized horizontal time scale, enabling the use of a single line to position a run in various categories, marked U here. To overcome the overplotting of the previous design, we added stacked area charts that, although their perceptual limitations are known, are still well liked for their appeal and aesthetics. By tapping different segments of these area charts, passers by were able to apply filters to all other categories. Such as in the left image here, where the 35 to 44 year old segment has been tapped in the age category, revealing the run from people of those ages in the other categories in yellow. To draw attention and as a way to promote active hypothesis forming and deeper engagement with the data, a series of somewhat provocative titles rotated above the visualization itself, such as do young people run faster or does weight influence speed. On the starting screen in the center here, passers by could either enter the first name and initials of a runner on Strava or choose one of the list of predefined profiles, such as the fastest this week or one of the youngest or oldest runners in case they did not personally know a Strava user. 
this design only presents a single run at a time. So in order to support concurrent use, we added a second display. On this display, the time of the run that is presented on the other is shown using the other display marker visible on the right image here. When starting a visualization, the user is presented with a narrative tutorial. This tutorial reveals and explains the different visual encodings, annotations, and interaction possibilities by adding one element at a time, gradually revealing the entire public visualization. The visualization was deployed onto two connected touch-enabled public displays in a sports facility building next to a local running trail on our university campus. This sports facility building is situated immediately next to the running trail where we sourced our Strava data from. During the deployment, we used a mixed method evaluation protocol that consists of automated logging, video and personal observations, audio recordings when no other observations were made, and on-site interviews. Using this combination of methods from public display and visualization research, we specifically aimed to more holistically evaluate the engagement with the displays and discover insights that connect both fields. We analyzed the engagement according to the passive active discovery engagement model for public displays. The digital logs captured 542 visualization starts from which we derived 235 distinct sessions and sessions were defined by a groups of interactions separated by idle time. While we only observed four instances of the classical honeypot effect, which is when observing others who are interacting attracts new users, we did notice four additional instances of what we coined a detached honeypot effect, such as depicted here. This is when the abandoned visualization state of the public display drew the attention of passersby without the presence of any active users. Only 84 or 34% of the sessions engaged with the visualization actively. Our observations show that such active engagement often related to passersby who only consumed the first part of the tutorial to satisfy their initial curiosity. Factors of the design that promoted use included the provocative titles that were regularly the subject of discussion among passersby, personal relevance when looking up one's own or the runs of acquaintances, the novelty of the touch display and system itself, or familiarity with Strava. Conversely, those who did not use Strava sometimes felt unable to use the interface as they expected that they needed to have an account. Other factors that inhibited use were mild personal interest in deeply analyzing performances, as many were more casual runners and did not necessarily want to fully analyze their running activity. A mismatch between the placement of the visualization and pre-existing routines, such as for many in the track, is only a part of their total run, and it does not warrant a dedicated break. Finally, the density of the visualization was a recurring inhibitor, as we often observe people to break off their engagement when the full visualization was revealed. 123 sessions reached the discovery stage as they involved the purposeful use of multiple filters or queries. The majority of these sessions reached the stage by following the complete tutorial and then performing multiple queries or actively using filters. However, many others performed multiple queries yet only consumed the visualization that was shown in the first step of the tutorial, each time and then immediately returning back to the starting screen, adopting a analytical strategy that we did not design for. Just over 20% of sessions contained interactions with both displays. Shared display use often occurred to construct a common interpretive frame in order to understand the interactive functionalities and the visual encoding. Once a common interpretive frame was established, we observed how group members dispersed in three distinct patterns that we named handoff, parallel, and trial. Trial interaction typically occurred at the start or end of a session as members were figuring out how the two displays were linked. The handoff pattern is then indicative of how a single group member moved to the other display to interact for themselves and how the detached honeypot effect provided a frictionless starting point for new users. While parallel interaction represents simultaneous use of both displays, the visual marker of the other display was rarely understood or used in practice. Social interaction around the public visualization centered around three themes. The hypothetical titles sparked discussions between passersby as they theorized about potential answers. However, their influence rarely extended into the actual analysis, where people would, in theory, be able to look up answers to these questions. The social context sparked conversations as they looked up others they knew and shared their recent performances or jokingly looked up each other's runs. The data source itself was often discussed in terms of different types of bias, such as uncertainty and implicit error. Passersby who were familiar with Strava 
associated it with more competitive athletes, sometimes leading to doubts about its broader relevance. Users doubted the accuracy of the data due to its due to personal experiences, but also stories of cheating and errors, such as bad GPS signals or not up-to-date personal information. After interacting, we approached users to list any insights they had discovered. Typically, users walked away with 1 to 12 insights. Most of these were based on comparisons within the same category, for example, about the influence of aging or weight. More than half of the interviewees included personal reflections in their insights, where they then compared their own performance to a subcategory, for example, another age, or one of the predefined profiles from the starting screen. Insights contained references to the social context, such as the presence of many students, the physical context, such as the current state of the track due to the weather, and the data context, like mentioned earlier. Most formulate their insights as contradictions or confirmations, suggesting that they had some domain knowledge that was either confirmed or refuted. In order to more holistically capture all facets of a public visualization deployment, particularly in an in-the-wild setting that has to withstand many contextual and pragmatic factors, we use methods from both visualization and public display research. By combining different methods and theories from both fields, we were able to formulate insights that connect both of them. For example, we found that traces of data exploration can trigger a detached honeypot effect, where the titles can be effective entry points that help overcome display blindness. As such, the study demonstrates how models from data visualization and public displays can be combined to provide a more encompassing evaluation of a public data visualization. Our results suggest that our public visualization catered for two distinct user types, those with a personal interest actively queried themselves or their acquaintances, and those with more casual interest mainly used the predefined profiles, situating the visualization either more closely to the actual running track or in a more all-around location would have likely shifted the balance to one of these two user profiles. Critical perspectives of privacy and ethics are even more prevalent in public data visualization, specifically visualizing personal data. As we have found in our previous work as well, visualizing data that refers directly to the community of intended users can cause some embarrassment because onlookers might recognize motivations for exploring certain data. While looking at someone else's performance on a mobile app might be very common, doing so on a public display gains a very different social undertone. Although it was relatively rare and most users did not mind the rather anonymous presentation of personal data, a few reflected on the correlation of potential sensitive information, such as age, weight, or even gender, being so publicly correlated to performances. Although all the presented data was publicly available, there are clearly specific additional tensions in publicly visualizing such data and issues of self-representation and privacy. In conclusion, we presented the design and in-the-wild evaluation of an analytical public data visualization. We think our findings and the concrete takeaways that are listed in the paper contribute to the development of this subdomain. We also believe that there is a great potential in further combining insights from both public display and visualization fields towards making data more accessible in casual and opportunistic settings, particularly where users or community interests are reflected in rich data sources that have immediate relevance to a physical location. Finally, we want to advocate for more studies that go beyond controlled environments, where interest in learning about a topic cannot necessarily be expected, and engagement is more opportunistic. Thank you for watching, and please feel free to contact us to discuss further. Thank you very much, Yorgos, for this fantastic presentation. So uh, uh, the audience, please uh, feel uh, encouraged to put some of your questions into one of the chats uh, and they will be forwarded to us. So while you're thinking hard about these questions, let me start, Yorgos, uh, with uh, some of my questions as an icebreaker here. So um, I was wondering, so the interaction, those were the touch displays that you used, right? And so I, I know from the Kai community, it's a little bit um, like older research, but there's a lot of research on like, you know, uh, like the, uh, the effect of bystanders, but also like collaborative touch touch display. So um, have you observed any of that? So do like, you know, did people like engage together in groups? And the second question along those lines is, was this study done before Corona? Because like with a touch display, like it might be really tricky, right? You know, people touching and, and I think like, you know, in, in your pictures and videos, I saw that people were not wearing masks. So this is the easier question. Yes. Maybe you start with the, the <laughs> second one and then the first one. Good. Okay. Um, indeed, that happened, uh, the study happened 
right before uh, COVID uh, started emerging in, uh, in Belgium, at least. Um, but there was definitely already some talk going on about uh, about the virus. So um, yeah, it's it's possible that the, the display was a, a, <laughs> a spreader of, of virus, but I've heard now that uh, such interfaces are not uh, are supposedly not that uh, that much of a cause for spreading the virus. But uh, yeah, indeed, that's a good question. Something I'm also not sure about how we will uh, continue doing this type of uh, research. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. We need hand sanitizers near each display, or <laughs> or we need to think about entirely different uh, direction modalities. Yeah, um, and then the, your first question. Um, had to do with the uh, kind of shared interaction, right? Um, so indeed, we saw that um, people tended to, yeah, uh, when they interacted in groups, they first shared one screen to try to understand how everything worked. Um, could, then they could more easily discuss and refer to specific elements of the interface uh, to understand, for example, the direction of the of the axis. Um, and then they would split up and start using it independently. Um, but okay. most of the conversation happened when they were sharing one display, uh, less so when they were yeah, each, using the, uh, yeah, each using one display. Yeah. Okay, so there's some potential of like uh, extending your designs to something where you can bring them together then like, you know, by combining both displays or something like that. That's interesting. Thank you very much. Um, we now have two questions by Wolfgang Eigner. His first question, uh, hi Wolfgang, uh, is, uh, is related to another question that I had on privacy, which is, uh, can users decide whether their data is included in the public displays or not? Uh, no, so we used data that was uh, publicly, that, all was, that they already have publicly shared on Strava. Uh, so we just used a regular open, uh, yeah, the regular Strava API, we didn't get any specific additional access. Um, so all of the, the data was um, yeah, that was publicly shared by them was also available to us. Um, however, yeah, it's important to note that they, uh, that this only includes a first name and an initial, so not a full name uh, to, yeah, to be fully identifiable. But it's, yeah. I think those sort of words, they can definitely bring up interesting privacy issues, which you also hinted upon on your, your last slide. So yeah, there's a, another uh, question from Wolfgang. Um, uh, how long were sessions of user engagement on average? So very concrete uh, question here. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to... Look at the paper. See, there, was a, there was a wide range of difference between the sessions that I can see for sure. Um, so there were very short ones where people just immediately uh, abandon it after seeing the first part of the introduction tutorial or when they skipped it the entire visualization was shown and then they were often kind of put back by the density of, a, of, the, of the visualization but there were also some instances where they spent uh, more than 10 minutes exploring all of the different categories and all of the attributes that they could uh, take, that were available so yeah there's a wide range um, okay, the details great. are in the paper yeah Thank you very much. There is also another question coming in from uh, Alexandra Deal. Thanks, Alexandra. Uh, would you consider your experiment to be a controlled study or a study in the wild? Uh, definitely a, a study in, in the wild. In, in the wild study, um, we uh, we did not invite any participants to to specifically come at a specific time or something like that. Um, we have in the past colleagues of mine uh, worked on. Uh, what they called a um, controlled in the wild evaluation, where you invite people but still do it in the wild. Uh, but that's not what we did here. So we, it's all based on uh, people who really opportunistically engaged with the uh, with the interface or, or chose not to. Um, yeah. Okay, cool, cool. So let me also like ask one of uh, my questions or my my last question. So, um, so I've personally worked on a lot of like what. I would consider a classical design study. So working together with some domain experts that have an incredibly hard uh, problem and they have lots of data. And so the challenges here are mostly like, you know, talking to these people and like overcoming all these pitfalls from like, you know, uh, the, the communication on like this complex matter. I feel like uh, uh, the work that you've been doing is very similar. It also needs a lot of like design thinking, but the instincts and the challenges are different. Have you thought about uh, those two, like, you know, different types of methods the logical approaches and what the differences are. Yeah, 
Um, yeah, we, we did start with uh, with the pre-design that I mentioned earlier. Um, so yeah, and even before that, we had a, a, a technology probe that we deployed at one running event. So we, we did try to take this iterative uh, process of uh, starting with initial, initially just a probe with very basic visualizations and trying to understand based on that what the interests are of runners um, first at these events. Um, and then yeah, iteratively improving the visualization design we also did a pilot test before this final deployment. Um, so I, yeah, I think that for us, that was the main way of, of working with our experts, let's say, that people uh, using this, this uh, using this running track, using this space. Um, yeah. OK, so it says like the iterative process is essentially like, you know, very similar then, but probably the difference is like the uh, the breadth of the audience and uh, the, the background. Indeed. So the yeah, runners, sorry, have many of them yeah. using. Yeah. OK. OK, cool. Yeah, this is where we much. found that there's a, a very big difference in, in how they if they're really interested in understanding all of the if they're competitively minded and want to understand all of the specifics and really delve deep or they're more social yeah. runners and are more interested in their personal experience rather than the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Okay, so while we were discussing, there is, uh, was one uh, other question flying in from Wolfgang Eigner, uh, which I will take as the last question uh, before we go on with the next speaker then. Uh, did you consider combining different devices, for instance, like a public display with, the, with a smartwatch or a, a mobile device or something like that? Yeah, um, not really. We, we really focused on, on a public display because we wanted to uh, the greatest the shared uh, experience of, of interacting with the data. Um, of course, people use their own personal device during uh, to go to, to record the data. Um, but we uh, we wanted that yeah, kind of to have a that already exists. We wanted kind of a, the the opposite of this very personal individual experience, something that's more shared and more uh, social, and can hopefully then through this discussion lead to other insights. Mm -hmm. Okay, sounds great. So thank you very much. Uh, please, everyone, uh, join me uh, in thanking Yorgos again for this uh, fantastic talk. I know it's a little bit awkward because we can't see you, but Yorgos, this is uh, the applause for like the millions of people that are, are out there and uh, have followed this discussion. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so we're um, uh, going on with the next talk, uh, which is uh, will be given by Davide uh, uh, Zeneda. And it will be on uh, the paper Guide Me in Analysis, a framework for guidance designers. And it's a collaborative work uh, with Natalie Andrienko, many like you know, other famous co-authors. They're a long author list, so please take a look at, at that yourself. And with that, without that, uh, without further ado, I want to like you know hand over the microphone uh, then uh, to Davide, who will give the talk. Please post your questions. Uh, take an example by Wolfgang and Alexandra, who already have been really active in participating in this discussion. Yes. OK, here we go. So hello, everyone. My name is Davide Ceneta. And today, on behalf of my wonderful co-authors, I would like to present you our joint paper, Guide Mean Analysis, a framework for guidance designers. So this paper was published last year as a computer graphics forum article. And at this regard, I would like to thank the organizers and the paper chairs for inviting us today to present our work. That said, let's get immediately to the topic of this presentation. So today I will present you how we created and built a conceptual framework to design effective guidance in visual analytics. To do that, I will first introduce a bit the topic of guidance and describe why a framework for guidance is needed. Then I will describe the results of our research, that is, what it means effective guidance and how we can design it. In this regard, I will use an illustrative example to show how our framework can be applied in practice. And finally, I will conclude this presentation discussing our results and open challenges. Let's start from the beginning. What does it mean, guidance? The term guidance refers to all the processes that aim to solve a so-called knowledge gap. But what is a knowledge gap? So imagine we want to achieve something. Let's imagine we have a goal in mind. Let's say we want to make a pizza. We can say that the knowledge gap arises from the discrepancy between what we need to know to reach our goal and what we actually know. In other words, the knowledge gap is what hinders the realization of our goal. For instance, maybe we don't know how to prepare the pizza dough, how much yeast, water and flour to mix together, or how long it should stay in the oven. Now let's move to the field of visual analytics. What does it mean guidance and knowledge gap in this context? 
So also in this case, a knowledge gap is something that we don't know that hinders the achievement of our goal. In other words, it hinders the conclusions of the analysis. For instance, maybe we don't know how to set query conditions to extract the data we want to analyze. Or maybe we don't know what techniques or methods could be appropriate to analyze the data. In other occasions, maybe the user doesn't know how to interpret the results obtained. How do, how do we evaluate the results? And how do we compare results obtained under different conditions? These are all knowledge gaps. And as all knowledge gaps, they hinder us from getting insights. So what we can say is that the goal of guidance is to help users solve the, the knowledge gap in, on their own and help them getting insights into the data. Until now, the research only focused on describing guidance. So for instance, all the problems we listed so far have all been described as knowledge gaps and classified according to their type or domain. Other aspects of guidance that have been described are for instance the guidance degrees. So this aspect tells us how much assistance the user might need to solve the knowledge gap. However, until now, the research didn't focus at all on describing how guidance should be designed. So in this work, we switch sides. We take all the problem of guidance from the perspective of designers instead of normal users. This is our focus in this presentation. So we describe what are the factors to be considered and what are the steps to design effective guidance. And this is how we arrive to the questions we address with our research. The first one is, how do we design effective guidance to support a positive analysis outcome? And what questions and what criteria should guide the development of effective guidance? So to answer these questions, we built a framework for designing guidance. And in addition, we describe what it means effective guidance and what are the qualitative criteria we should use as designers to evaluate alternative designs. So before continuing the presentation, I would like to make a short digression to explain the methodology we used to reach our goal. So we used the bottom-up approach. So we started with the literature research, focusing on existing guidance approaches and existing design methodologies. So thanks to this research, we created an initial step, set of criteria that we realized to be important to design effective guidance in visual analytics. These are availability, trustworthiness, adaptivity, controllability, and non-disruptiveness. As a result of this initial phase, we also produce a raw list of steps and description of their interdependencies. We later confronted such initial output with our experience in the field. Since we already developed up, uh, guidance approaches in the past, this experience helped us in refining the initial output into a list of steps and design requirements. So our goal then is to design effective guidance, but what does it mean for the guidance to be effective? So the effectiveness of guidance is tied to developing mechanisms that should help analysts completing the task while overcoming possible issues that could arise during the analysis. So to obtain such results, a number of requirements have to be fulfilled. So in order to be effective, guidance has to comply to five qualitative criteria. So the first one tells us that guidance should be available. So this means that the guidance should be there for you. In other words, users should be aware that the guidance is available and that it could be uh, requested at any time. In order to be effective, the guidance has to be trustworthy. This means that the user can be sure that the guidance will help. In other words, guidance should be regarded as a way to overcome the uncertainty involved in the analysis and not to be a source of further confusion. In order to be effective, the guidance has to be adaptive. This means that the guidance will adapt to the situation. In other words, usually as the analysis evolves, so do the problems the users encounter. So the guidance system must know what the actual state of the analysis is in order to deal with the knowledge gaps that change over time. In order to be effective, the guidance has to be controllable. This means that the guidance can be tuned if necessary. So this because the user needs to be in control of the analysis. Finally, in order to be effective, the guidance has to be non-disruptive. This means that the guidance will not annoy nor mislead, mislead you. In other words, the guidance should not be disrupt the analysis flow nor the analyst mental map. As mentioned earlier, after defining a set of, fa of factors and criteria to evaluate the effectiveness of guidance, we also imagined and built a design framework. As you can see, it is composed by four steps, which are analysis calls, knowledge gaps, guidance generation, and guidance feedback. The framework is composed also of iterative cycles in which then the design can be refined and fine-tuned. And we also associated to each step 
a set of questions that should be answered to design effective guidance. So in total, the designer should answer 12 questions. Like for instance, what are the analysis goals? Or what guidance degree should we use? We will get back to this question shortly. So now what I want to do is going through all the design steps and explain them, also answering the related questions. So to help me describe how the framework works, I will use an example. So let's imagine that we want to design guidance to support a task that we call blind source separation. So what task is that? A blind source separation task is the task of separating a series of measurements, like multiple time series, into their, their basic components. So this process is called blind because we don't want to impose any assumption on the time series in input. This is a problem that is relevant in many domains. For instance, let's imagine that we have multiple sensors recording the, the temperature of the environment. So the goal here is to extract the measurements and separate them maybe from the noise, for instance. Another application scenario is the one in which we want to separate, for instance, the electrocardiogram of a pregnant woman from that of the baby in the belly. So our goal now as designers is to design guidance to support this task. So how do we do that? So we take our framework and, start, and, and we start from step number one. So the first step deals with analyzing the requirements of the analysis. Its goal is to define in a precise way the goals of the analysis we want to reach with guidance. So two questions are associated with this step. What are the analysis goals and in which analysis phases might occur issues? According to our scenario, the, the answer to the first question is obviously that we want to design guidance to support the blind source separation problem. Moving to the second question, what we can do is analyzing how our analysis typically solve this task, because in this way we can understand what problems might occur. So by interviewing the, the end users, we discovered that a typical analysis scenario works in this way. So the analysts start the task by using a computer running statistical software like R. The analyst already faces some issues from the beginning of the analysis, because the user needs already to choose the parameters for the algorithms that will perform the separation of the signals. Afterwards, the user is presented with some images representing the components of the, of the initial signals. The user has to analyze these visualizations to see if the results make sense. But the task here presents also some challenges, because the results have to be interpreted in the light of the domain in which the initial signals were captured. So furthermore, the knowledge of the users could play an important role. So novice analysts might encounter problems in this phase of the analysis. The following step for the user is to compare the obtained results with results obtained in past iterations. Also here, the task can be challenging because the user, the user needs to select appropriate results for comparison. Finally, on the base of the results, the user finally refines the parameters and repeats the process until a good solution is achieved. This is the end of the first design step, which, as we have seen, is focused on the providing details on the analysis and the tasks. There are some risks and threats associated with this step, which is mostly related to a bad analysis of the requirements of the task. In particular, the designer in this phase could underestimate, overestimate, or in general misinterpret the goals of the analysis. So, as known from user-centered visualization textbooks, a good suggestion in such cases is to always pursue this step in collaboration with end users. Then we can move to the second step, which has the goal of defining the knowledge gaps the user will probably face. There are also in this case some questions associated to this design step. And the first one is, what knowledge gaps might hinder the prosecution of the analysis? So to answer this question, it could be helpful to think if the user is facing problem of executing task or planning the task. And in general, it could be helpful to think of the type of knowledge gaps we are dealing with. In our scenario, we have three knowledge gaps. The first one is that the parameter space is really huge, so the user needs help to select the correct parameters, especially at the beginning of the analysis. The second and third knowledge gaps are instead related to the exploration and the interpretation of the results. So the following question of step number two have the goal of providing additional details of the knowledge gaps. So question number four is, are the analysts aware or unaware of their knowledge gaps? In other words, are the knowledge gaps perceived by the user or unconscious? So this is an important question because we have to think of different solutions according to how we answer this question. So the last question of step number two is that asks us to think of methods or ways to identify the knowledge gaps during the analysis. In other words, it tells us to design either a knowledge gap interface so that the user 
could communicate their problems, or a knowledge gap inference, so that the system could infer autonomously the knowledge gap of the user if, if the user is unaware of them. Also, step number two presents some challenges. So the major risk associated with this step are the misinterpretation of the knowledge gap, which might affect the completeness of the guidance solution we are designing. So in other words, we might forget to design guidance on some, some problems. So to tackle these problems, the designer should think, for instance, to try to isolate the top-end knowledge gaps and design guidance for those as a starting point. So a more advanced solution would be instead to design adaptive guidance mechanisms so that the system can learn while being used. Then we can pass to the third design step that deals with designing guidance for the problems we found in the previous steps. At this regard, a number of questions should be answered. For instance, it makes sense to think of the, what guidance degree should we use, or what input is available to generate guidance, so, or what algorithms and procedures are needed to generate guidance, or what visual means could be used to communicate the guidance, and finally, what is a good moment to provide the guidance. According to our scenario, we can use different input sources to generate guidance. For instance, on the base of some statistical values calculated at the beginning of the analysis, the system might suggest to the user the most appropriate parameter settings. This kind of guidance can be classified as oriented guidance. The designers also found out that it is possible to use the knowledge of the domain, when this is available, to inform the selection of parameters. With this guidance, we can easily address the knowledge gap number one. To address the other knowledge gaps, the designers thought to use a machine learning algorithm to classify and group the output of the separation algorithms. In this way, the exploration and interpretation of the results is facilitated. Also, step three comes with its own risks. For instance, if we don't design guidance correctly, we might introduce additional biases. Another problem is that we could choose the wrong guidance degree. Finally, we could also choose an inappropriate time to provide guidance. Finally, we come to the last design step, which aims to make the guidance as a mixed initiative process. So these steps ask us to think of ways to integrate the user feedback into the system in such a way, let's say, to guide the system. In this regard, we should answer two questions. The first one is, how can the system derive guidance from the analyst actions? And we, have, we can have two options to answer this question. So we can have direct feedback in which the analyst uses the widgets of the UI to change the guidance parameters directly. Then we can also have indirect feedback. In this scenario, the analyst acts on the data and these actions affect the generation of guidance in an indirect way. The second question is, what is the direction of the analyst's feedback? Also in this case, we have two options. The past guidance, calling the, and we call this feedback, or we can ask for guidance in the future, and we call this feed forward. In our scenario, this was done by including the results of the analysis to improve future tasks. So results obtained by the users are reused to improve the classification and the guidance suggestions in the future. So the major risk associated with this design step is obviously that if not done correctly, we would end up with uncontrollable guidance. This is the end of the design. Obviously, the design process is iterative, so we might have multiple design iterations. What we have seen so far is that our framework is general enough to help us define guidance in multiple scenarios. Another thing we can say, though, is that our framework can be helpful also to classify existing VA approaches and possibly identify ways to improve such, a, such approaches with guidance. So this is what we did in the paper. You can find the details there. So finally, we come to the discussion of the results. So what we have done is creating a framework to design guidance, which aims to be a complete framework. In fact, we try to consider all the major aspects that should be considered when designing guidance. So the framework is an iterative process, so it allows multiple feedback and evaluation cycles. Obviously, it is not perfect, so it would be helpful to evaluate the design choices in real use case scenarios to test their effectiveness. Also, need finding interviews could be a valuable tool to discover latent user needs and knowledge gaps. Finally, there is a strong similarity between how we design guidance and how we design VA tools, so this opens up to the possibility of creating a unified design process. However, I want to mention also that at the moment our framework is mostly an abstract tool to think of guidance. 
The framework, in fact, describes the steps that should be done to possibly design effective guidance, but it doesn't tell us how we can actually implement such guidance. For, for this reason, we list as a set of challenges and open research questions that should be tackled to make design of guidance easily, easily actionable. For instance, it would be nice to understand how we can measure numerically the effectiveness of guidance, or how do we allow a system to infer the knowledge gaps during the analysis. So in the end, I'll leave you with a short summary. In this paper, we built a conceptual framework to design effective guidance. So we reasoned about the meaning of the term effective and listed the set of qualitative criteria a guidance system should possess to be effective. So finally, we used our framework as a descriptive tool to analyze existing approaches, but we also applied it to prove that it can be indeed be helpful to design guidance to support a blind source separation task. That said, I thank you for your attention and I'm open to answer your question. Thank you very much, Davide, for this fantastic talk. Hello, thanks. Hello. It's also nice to see. I think your background is blurred, but I think I see some of the CVAST uh, office in Vienna, yeah. right? I hope the weather is fine there. Yeah. Uh, we have uh, already a few uh, questions um, in the chat, and uh, we will start uh, with uh, a question by Wolfgang Eigner. Again, it's actually a, a question that I also had uh, in mind when listening to your talk. Um, I, I interpret uh, Wolfgang that as like, you know, great minds thinking alike and not the German version zwei Deppen ein Gedanke. But okay, here we go. So um, the question is inferring knowledge gaps. Could you elaborate a bit on the state of research in that area, particularly approaches of automatic inference? Are there any examples of where this is done uh, he means successfully, not as in the infamous Clippy example of MS Office. Yeah, so thanks Wolfgang, Wolfgang for the interesting question. Um, yeah, there, there has been a lot of research in this area in the past. There are many, let's say, guidance approaches that try to do that, exactly that. They, usually what it happens is that there are some basically knowledge bases where you know, there, there is the interaction. So basically they use the uh, analytical prominence of, the, of other users and they match these with what the user has been doing uh, so far in the analysis. And then they try to, to see uh, if they can suggest improvements basically. So that's how it works, at least what, what has been done in the literature, it works more or less like this. That is, you match it, you see that something's going on, maybe it's bad, and then you provide suggestion to, to improve the situation. And yeah. Other, other, we also elaborate another, uh, about another possibility that is that the user itself, himself, it's, uh, is communicating the, the knowledge gap to the, to the system. And in this case, I mean, it's a bit more complicated because, you know, communicating knowledge, it's a bit difficult. There is an externalization process in between that it's not always easy to do. And, but for instance, there has been approaches like uh, uh, where you do guidance by example. So the, the user is guiding the system in that case, in, in this in this way so showing sketches what what are you looking for and then the system understands and provides guidance uh, accordingly there's another question uh, by wolfgang which is uh, very specific so maybe if you could go to slide 50 i'm not sure if you can share your slides again but for yourself and uh, there is q4 are the knowledge gaps perceived or unconscious typically aware so the question is could you talk about why this is the case so yeah, uh, in this, uh, so we, we thought of this framework and then we tried to apply it. And uh, basically in the first two steps, we tried to understand how um, users were doing their analysis and figure out what possible knowledge uh, gaps there were, you know? And uh, so by, when talking with them, uh, Afterwards, uh, we realized, um, basically we analyzed the scenario and we said, okay, but this could be a problem, this could be a problem. And they said, yeah, we are aware of all these problems. 
And uh, so this is why they, they were, I, I brought that they, they were aware of the knowledge gaps in that case, but there could be also cases, uh, this is a bit more challenging, uh, some cases where the knowledge gaps are not, uh, the, user, the user is not aware of them. And yeah. Okay, good, thank you very much. So I also do have uh, one higher level question. Uh, so I was wondering, uh, Davide, in how far the work that you're doing is specific for guidance designer. So essentially you're providing a guiding framework to guidance designer. And I was just wondering, I'm not an expert in that area, but my wife is actually an instructional designer. And it turns out they, I think they do very similar things. Specifically, the guidelines seem to be very uh, uh, similar that uh, the design requirements that you also uh, post on one of your slides here. And I was just wondering, and how far we could as a community just to, uh, reach out and look into what other people have done because this is an it's not a new area it has been around for a while right and like what we can adopt or at least adapt from them have you thought about that as well um yeah thanks for for the nice question for the it's it's really interesting yes um so the i mean we didn't invent guidance guidance has been going on for for a long time I think it started back in the I was 80s, something like that. And um, yeah, um, going to your question uh, and to uh, to and to the work we have done. Uh, so in this paper, we, what what we tried to do is not providing guidelines. We are not there yet, but uh, we tried to figure out what what are the factors that influence uh, the design process. So this is why we came up with these steps and all these questions. So somehow to give a guide to the um, uh, to the designer. The next step would be like saying, okay, in this scenario, you have to do this. It's better if you do that, uh, but we are not there yet. Uh, and regarding the interdisciplinary approach, I think it, 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 it's definitely something we should uh, pursue because uh, there has been a lot, this concept of guidance has been uh, tabled in many other domains, and I, when I also do the do many, you uh, try to explain guidance. I use examples from other domains like guiding the cars, so autonomous cars, something like that. Or yes, as I did uh, in this presentation with recipes, and uh, there has been a lot of going on in HCI, in HCI and uh, decision decision making too. So yeah, yeah. Okay, so Natalie, uh, one of your co-authors also uh, uh, posted an, a comment a slash question, which I think goes exactly into that line. Interesting, the framework seems to be applicable to design of various instructions, user manuals and so on and so forth or not. This is essentially also what, what I thought, yeah. Do you want to comment as well, Davide? Um, the framework is applicable to design of various instructions. Um, I don't know if I understood very well the uh, the, the comment here, but uh, yeah, I think there is a common a common approach to our yeah uh, we we can design guidance and now we for instance uh, this create user manuals and instructions and so on. So there is a similarity also with how we design. Vision IDX itself. So we should look into how we can integrate all this stuff into the Vision IDX process, into the design of the Vision IDX tools. Okay, great. So um, thank you very much again, uh, Davide, for that lovely presentation. Uh, thank you also, Natalia and uh, Wolfgang, for the questions. Let's all thank. Uh, Davide, again, and also let me congratulate you on your recently uh, uh, gathered PhD. Uh, I yeah, think thanks. Not last year, right? Thanks. Okay. Yes. And now I think there will be a slide of big applause before I will do the announcement for the next presentation. Then, thank you very much, Davide. Okay, welcome back, uh, and thanks for the big applause uh, for Davide's talk. And um, so now we're coming to the last presentation, which will be given by Namwook Kim on a uh, fantastic topic, very interesting, on accessible visualization, design space, opportunities, and challenges. So Namwuk, uh, the floor is yours. The audience, please do post uh, questions if you have some during the talk already.
Welcome. My name is Shaquilla Cherise Joyner, and it is my great pleasure to speak to you today about our work on accessible visualization, design space, opportunities, and challenges. Visualizations have become very popular as a handy tool to communicate data and their implications. They've entered the mainstream and made it to the homepage of your newspaper. The broad public is now used to receiving information through visualizations on the web. But this rapid advancement leaves visually impaired users out of the loop. About 217 million people have moderate to severe visual impairment. And another 36 million people are estimated to be blind. As simulated in this example, for them getting information from a visualization can be rather difficult. To reach all these people, non-visual ways to engage with the content should be provided. The guidelines to support inclusiveness suggest using alternative text that can be translated into speech. But data visualizations are just intrinsically different from other visual content such as pictures or even videos. Their systematic visual encodings possess a functionality, namely to represent the data in a way that can be processed more easily. This is why the current guidelines and practices just aren't sufficient here. And especially as we are advancing visualizations to become even more widespread, more complex, and more interactive, we can't neglect marginalized communities. We need to explore ways to make visualizations accessible to people with visual impairments. There have been some studies on the topic here and there, but research on accessibility and inclusiveness hasn't kept up with the field's recent advancements. Our survey in this work analyzes the past work and highlights the knowledge gap in visualization accessibility. From 1999 till 2020, only 56 unique research projects that focused on accessibility and visual impairment and addressed the accessibility of data-driven visualizations were published. Most frequently, the contributions were artifacts, so software or hardware designed to make visualizations accessible, for example, by providing a tactile or sonified version of a graph. What's interesting is that only three of those papers are from dedicated visualization conferences, including VIS and Eurovis. And when we look at those conferences, we'll find that they provide no specific submission keywords for accessibility. Still, we can learn from these contributions that comprise the current state of accessibility for visualizations in research. We performed a systematic literature review and collected the publications relevant to this topic by querying databases and conferences. We restricted our search to the past 20 years due to the relevance of technical advancements. Research that focused on other disabilities was excluded. For example, we did not consider color deficiency or cognitive impairments, which do not affect visual acuity. All citations can be found in our paper. Next, using a grounded theory-inspired open coding process, we analyzed the 56 papers and mapped out the design space of accessible visualizations. Seven dimensions span this design space. They allow us to categorize systems based on the why, what, and how of their accessibility. So when thinking about accessible visualizations, we need to consider why, so for which purpose, to support which users and tasks they are made accessible. Further, we can identify what, so what type of chart and interactions are made accessible. And we can look into how, so with how much information detail, with which sensory modalities, and using which assistive technologies accessibility is created. Different conditions that cause visual impairments can lead to various different experiences, such as blurry or spotted vision, and may or may not leave some residual vision to be used. Most research focuses on addressing the absence of vision, using the terms blindness and visual impairment interchangeably. 
Only a few studies specifically consider low vision users and the utilization of tools that cater to their needs, such as highlighting and magnification synchronized with screen reading. Furthermore, collaborating with sighted users is a need that just a few papers address, frequently in the constellation of sighted teachers working with visually impaired students. What we found is a significant gap that needs to be filled when it comes to understanding the needs and motivations of users with different visual experiences. Reading and creating are the two higher order tasks we observed. Reading groups all tasks that involve perceiving elements using alternative sensory channels, for example, retrieving values from a tactile line chart. Creating or constructing visualizations from scratch typically requires assigning visual encodings by interacting with the user interface. Enabling and supporting this can be tricky, and only 12 papers tackle such tasks. Even though the importance of tasks for evaluating visualizations is well known within the field of visualization, the body of work we analyzed did not allow for a deeper investigation. The majority of papers were published in other fields and thus don't use or aren't aware of the established task vocabulary. So, it's necessary that we systematically explore the tasks visually impaired people perform and look deeper into differences and similarities of how they perform tasks using non-visual channels. Another dimension to investigate is the chart type or the variety of charts that can be made accessible. Most systems can only deal with one specific type or a limited set of visualizations, mostly basic statistical plots such as bar charts or line charts. Some tackle somewhat more advanced charts such as statistical maps and network graphs. What stood out was that only very few papers report on more generalizable methods that can be applied to many different chart types such as annotating SVG elements to foster accessibility. Along with the growth that is happening in the visualization field, it will be more and more important to find adaptable ways for making the new, more advanced, and even custom and complex visualizations that we are now encountering accessible as well. Especially for those new visualizations, we need to look deeper into how visually impaired users make sense of them and what information on the visualization itself we need to convey. Many of these new visualizations frequently allow engagement through various forms of interactivity. But while this design dimension is explored in new ways for general visualizations, more than half the papers we reviewed do not address interaction at all, focusing on static visualizations instead. Visually impaired users, however, do interact with visualizations, frequently by navigating through a visualization and its different levels of detail using the keyboard. Screen readers can support some interactions, such as filtering data through user interface elements like drop-down menus or selecting items to highlight and trigger verbal feedback. More uncommon but rather interesting are interactions such as guidance provided through force feedback controllers. What is still unclear is how to enable more advanced interactions such as multiple coordinate views. As of now, these are often more search sources for accessibility issues than providing the intended benefit. Information granularity refers to the amount of detail conveyed in a visualization. On the most basic level, a user only receives information on the existence of a chart, but no information on the underlying dataset. This notification is often necessary since charts are typically embedded, perhaps just somewhere in a news article. On the next level, an overview, which includes the summary of the visual elements, the content, and the general data structure, helps to grasp the basic idea of a chart. The highest level of granularity is reached when details on the precise data values are provided. Most systems do this on an on-demand basis. The combination of overview and detail was the most common pattern we observed. It's important to investigate this granularity dimension. 
there's currently no consensus and no guidance on how to structure information within each level to support the needs of users that want to engage with the visualization more or less intensely. There are certainly interesting challenges to address when it comes to providing an efficient and informative overview and supporting the exploration of detail without getting stuck or overwhelmed. Choosing an alternative sensory modality to convey what a visualization shows visually is a critical design choice. What we found most frequently were approaches that address audio perception, which supports speech and sonification, or such that build on tactile perception. Speech is the most common and low-cost accessibility modality. This includes, for example, a number of systems that generate a textual description, which can then be read out by a screen reader. Sonification uses pitch variations to indicate an increase or decrease in data values. So users can basically listen to the melody of a graph. Although to convey precise values, a reference point must be provided verbally. For both speech and sound, the information is processed serially, which might make it difficult to use these modalities when intricate patterns or large data sets are involved. You could imagine that a long description of a complex visualization may defeat the purpose of making the data easier to understand. Especially since so far there is no agreement on how to structure such long chart descriptions. Likewise, there is no clear consensus on how sound dimensions, such as pitch or tempo, can best be mapped to dimensions which we know from visualizations, such as size. When deciding on which alternative sensory modality to use, designers must also consider assistive technologies that support them. The most widely accessible technology is a screen reader that basically reads out loud the elements on screen while the user navigates through the content using input devices such as the keyboard. Screen reader software can be bought but is often already available with many operating systems such as Android's TalkBack or Apple's VoiceOver or available free of charge like the screen reader NVDA. Tactile devices are usually more costly. Those include haptic devices such as the knob and falcon controller or touch-enabled tablets which can provide forced feedback through vibrations. If one wanted to create tactile graphics, a braille embusser would be required. Those are not something a typical user has at home. They are even more expensive and not laid out to be operated by a visually impaired person. We also observe custom hardware that explore new ways of interaction. And there's certainly room for more exploration as recent studies outside of the accessibility context investigate novel technologies, including data edibilization and an olfactory device. It's important that we explore different options while still keeping in mind that in practice, visually impaired users can be expected to have specific custom hardware for each and every new task. The design space provides a framework spanned by seven dimensions that are to be considered when it comes to accessible visualizations. Now let's think about how a user may engage with an accessible visualization. We constructed a model to dissect the user's flow of accessing information. This may guide the development and evaluation of accessible visualizations. Our four-stage model is similar but different from existing models such as the visualization visual information seeking mantra. The accessibility model focuses on the reading task and is based on our analysis of past research. Let's take a look at an example. While a user engages with an article on the web, an alert notifies the user of the existence of a chart. This can be done by simply mentioning chart at the beginning of the alternative text when the screen reader gets to the visualization or by describing the type of the chart or providing a braille label on a braille display. Next, an overview of the chart is provided. So a summary, including things such as its intended message, 
visual encoding structure, or descriptive values. Having a good title can help convey the message, but multi-hand exploration, as well as speeded sonification, can also provide an overview of the data trends. And these ways of directly exploring the underlying data structure instead of the interpreted message may allow for a less biased conclusion. After an overview is provided, users may or may not decide to further engage with the visualization. At this stage, details are offered when requested. For a sonified graph, individual data points can be played based on the user's control, or they may be provided verbally since for sonification as well as for touch, the information resolution is low. When users are actively exploring the details, the context may be conveyed when necessary. For instance, it can be useful to receive feedback on whether the current pointer is at the starting point or has reached the end point or what adjacent points to the current focus are. The contextual cues can be given along with the details or triggered only when needed or requested. Of course, this model should be extended through further research to incorporate the recent progress that we are seeing in the field. So what can we do next? The insights we've gained point us towards many interesting opportunities and challenges. There are plenty of opportunities, for example, in exploring design principles for supporting users with some remaining vision or with specific types of visual impairments. How can we personalize assistive technology to support different experiences? How feasible is it to provide additional visual aids such as magnification and contrast enhancement, even flickering and glow, instead of just substituting visual perception completely? Another important aspect for inclusiveness that needs to be advanced is the ability to interact with sighted colleagues, peers, and teachers. The role and responsibilities of sighted stakeholders need to be characterized and visually impaired users should be supported in creating visualizations for an equally broad audience. We need to research the exact needs for creating visualizations as well as the ways in which more advanced visualizations can be created. In fact, building knowledge beyond simple visualizations is an important challenge to tackle. As of now, there are still many visualizations such as tree maps and complex interactions that are out of scope for visualization accessibility. We could leverage existing visualization and interaction taxonomies to assess what additional support would be necessary. Other challenges we need to tackle are exploring generalizable yet affordable approaches that are feasible to be applied beyond the research setting, automating the process of making visualizations accessible, and leveraging low-cost and commonly available mediums are of interest here. We encountered some approaches that attempt to automatically provide chart descriptions, which were at the preliminary stage but nevertheless important to tackle issues such as supporting interactive visualizations where views are constantly changing. In general, natural language generation can be an inexpensive alternative to more expensive or custom hardware and approaches such as question and answer could be refined to optimize exploration for a various level of interest in detail. A third space for opportunities lies in expanding on the established visual perception framework by reusing systematic approaches that have been applied to visual perception to understanding other modalities. For example, when designing auditory visualizations, researchers can classify, characterize, and evaluate the different auditory channels by drawing parallel effectiveness and expressiveness principles. And yes, while it is useful to understand each sensory modality on its own, there is so much we still need to learn about the trade-off among multiple re related modalities. For example, how about conducting comparative studies to see how one modality may outperform another in specific contexts or on certain tasks? In our work, we provide an overview on visualization accessibility research over the last two decades. 
We mapped out a design space of accessible visualizations, including the seven dimensions, users, tasks, chart types, interaction, information granularity, modality, and assistive technologies. Based on the past research we reviewed, we proposed a model to support accessibility and outlined the opportunities and challenges to inform future research in the domain. We are hoping that our work motivates more research into inclusive and accessible visualization. Okay, thank you very much for this fantastic talk, Shakila. As most of you uh, probably noticed, uh, this was not Nam Wook giving the talk, but it was uh, Shakila. A very clear, very important topic. Uh, thanks for that uh, presentation. Um, and now, please. Me. Uh, for the audience, uh, put your questions into the chat. We already have one by our um, most active member today, Wolfgang Eigner. He probably will get the prize of the most active uh, uh, participant in that session, unless like somebody else wants to like, you know, catch up now. Um, so let's start with Wolfgang's question uh, here. Uh, did you find approaches that use existing technologies uh, such as uh, screen readers for visualization based on extracted textual descriptions, for example? Yes, definitely. So there are approaches that um, yeah, try to extract the information value that a visualization um, holds and convey it in a textual way or in a, a text to speech way. Um, there are automated approaches that use uh, AI to extract that information. But I guess the question is, does the textual description um, is it really sufficient for the purpose of replacing a visualization? Because all these benefits that the visual perception holds, they, they are lost. But definitely there are uh, approaches, yes. Okay, great. So there's another question, guess by who? Uh, Wolfgang, thank you. Um, so this was actually the first question he, he put into the chat. And I think some of your uh, slides later on that came after his question already uh, were speaking to that. But like, I think it's still worth discussing. Did you find approaches that uh, use, oops, oops, no, there's another one coming in. Visualization accessibility, a very important area with a lot of work to be done for our community. For instance, what would be the equivalent to the alt tag for visualizations? Um, alt, tags, alt tags are currently being used for visualizations as well. As, as I said, the question is whether or not that they are sufficient. And perhaps um, there isn't a one size fits all approach as of now, especially as I mentioned in the talk. Also, if we look at interactive visualizations, it gets even more trickier to yeah, use a static alt tag um, to convey those. So uh, I'm hoping that we as a community will put in more work and actually ideally think of accessibility when we are thinking of new visualizations. Okay, um, we have more questions flying in. So Jason Dykes has an interesting point. I reckon you can comply in ways that may not be helpful. How can we be helpful? Yeah, definitely. That's a good question. And I guess it's actually the most important uh, question or the most important part of our research is um, to get people to make an effort in the first place. Um, for example, if you, if you would browse through the internet now and you would look at visualizations and check out the alt tag, they might have a um, very unuseful alt tag. So in that case, um, maybe put yourself in the position of a visually impaired user that would come across your website and they would have a alt text perhaps just telling them image. Um, at that point, the uncertainty of what is in this image just grows and the user might spend more time um, yeah, wondering what you could see in this visualization instead of actually getting some information. Okay, thank you very much. 
I uh, realized that we're running a little bit out of time and we have many uh, more questions coming in. Uh, we will take one more questions. And for the other ones, um, I also have a, a few uh, other questions actually that would, I would have liked to ask, but um, please go to Discord. Um, uh, I'm pretty sure Shakila, you will be there and then also the reply to these questions there. So let's take in the last question for today for the live session, which is a, a post by Lars Noneman. Uh, have you already discussed your ideas with visually impaired people? It would be interesting to know how this user group might perceive more unconventional representations, such as parallel coordinates. And you also mentioned things like particip participatory design. I think that's exactly that question. Yeah, so um, in this stage of our research, we had not, um, but it's definitely very important to include the people that this pertains to. And yeah, it's also extremely important and interesting questions. How are visually impaired users actually uh, perceiving specific elements that we're talking about? So in this previous or this current phase that we were talking about now, um, we were looking at the current state of research. So hopefully the next stage would be talking to visually impaired uh, users. Okay, thank you very much. We are all very much looking forward to that paper when we report on these experiences. <laughs> so uh, thank you, Shakina, again for that um, uh, lovely presentation. Let's all thank all our speakers again. Let's uh, thank Yorgos, Davide, and Shakila for the lovely presentations. And for more discussions, please come to the Discord channel and like be participate uh, do participate in the lively discussions that will happen there. Thank you very much. And now I'm concluding the session.